everybody doing? Let's stand up as we do confessions this morning and get into worship. So just repeat after me. We are the body of Christ. And Satan has no power over us. Today we stand in agreement and say that we overcome evil with good. For God is with us. Lord, your word and your spirit, they comfort us. We are far from oppression, and fear does not come near us. Today we put on the whole armor of God, saying we stand boldly and say, we stand against any plan you have for us. Together we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We are victorious against our enemies for we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. In unity we believe that no weapon formed against us shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against us shall be condemned for we are doers of the word of God we take the shield of faith and defeat every attack that the wicked one brings against us we are protected we are healthy we are wealthy we are anointed we are whole there's nothing missing there's nothing broken name of Jesus Lord we thank you that we operate in the multiplication anointing we multiply in every area of ministry we thank you that your word declares that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous for we are righteous we are righteous Say like you mean it. We are righteous. It's gonna clap going in this place.
lift your voice all over this place. God, I sing praises, I sing praises. God, I praise your name, I praise your name. Church, would you lift your voice and sing it? Come on, just lift your voice. I want to hear you sing it. That's it. That's it. Lift your voice to heaven this morning. You're so worthy, Jesus. Come on, sing it again from the bottom of your heart. Just make sure it's towards him this morning. our voice to you God and we sing praises to you Say that one more time. Your name is great, God. God, right now, move through this building, God. Come on, you can praise him. Come on now, I want you to praise him in a prayer. Would you just begin to lift up a voice in prayer? God, you're so worthy, God. Come on, let me hear you pray to him this morning. God, you're so worthy. God, we worship you in this atmosphere, God, because you're worthy. God, we praise you because you're worthy. Lord, our desire is to spend time with you, God. Fill this room, God, with your presence. Or fill your, this room with the atmosphere of the glory of God. God, I already feel the people walked in this morning. There's somebody walked in broken. And the Lord has said today healing is coming to your house. 
Oh, come on. We, I, I already feel the presence of God in here this morning. You walked in here not knowing how you was going to make it through this week or how you was even going to get through the day, but this was your last hope. God said, I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting on you just to call on my name. He said, what man said is impossible. God said, I can change in an instant. For I spoke this world into existence just by a word. There is no problem I can't handle. For I own everything. Come on, can you just begin to pray all over this place? I just feel like somebody walked in here today needing Jesus. I feel like there's some Christian people that has lost some faith along the way. I feel like God is restoring something this morning. I just feel like this is going to be a morning, a morning of restoration that what you thought was over, God said, I'm about to restore. Come on, church. I need some prayer warriors just to begin to pray. Come on, your life is about to shift. Come on, if you can feel that thing right now turning in your stomach. You said, I know this word is for me. I came here as a last resort. Listen, you ain't got to wait for everybody else. You can come to this altar at any time. I, I'm not on a man's program. I'm not on somebody else's schedule. We're following the spirit of God in this place. Come on, you just hadn't took that step of faith yet. You said, my, it can't change. God says, you don't know me. It can't be fixed. God says, you don't know me. I, I can't overcome it. God says, you don't know me. For there is no problem I can't fix. And there is no obstacle that I can't overcome. For I am the I am's. I just hear the Lord tell somebody else, you thinking I can't have a happy marriage. The Lord said you can have happiness and peace. My finances are too broken. God said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Why do you run from me when I love you so much? Why do you run from me when I love you so much? Can you not see that I love you? Can you not see that I want to be there for you? For behold, I stand at the door waiting for you to knock. This, this might just be one person, but I believe there's several people in here. You need a touch from God this morning. I'm not going to move right yet if that'll be all right, but this altar is already open.
Come on, church, worship him this morning. Father, we bless you. We welcome your presence. We've prayed. We've asked. We've met together. We've done all kinds of things. And we know that you're here right now. We know that you're drawing hearts. 
Why do you wait? Why do you halt? Why do you stand back and not come? You feel my hand. You sense my heart. You think there's something you're going to lose, something you're going to miss, something you're not going to enjoy. But I tell you as the Lord God Almighty, I gave my son that you right now in this moment would come to him, would be freed. You wrestle, you're tormented, you worry, you're sleepless at times. Your mind is racing, you're looking, wondering, what can I do? How can I go? Where can I go? What can I do? And I tell you today in this house, in the presence of my people, come to my son. Come to my Lord, my Jesus, the one I gave for you. I so loved you. And I love you now. My eyes are on you. My heart is open to you. My altar is ready. The blood of my son is ready to cleanse. And I'm here to break every chain. Your life will begin to change the moment you come to this altar. Father, I pray right now with pastor and with his congregation. Touch the hearts. We break every hold of the enemy, the lies in the mind that would try to hold someone back. We break that right now. And we believe you, Lord. Draw them. Help them. Come. The Lord is stopping this whole service at this point for you. That's how much he loves you. Don't wait. Don't hold back. About 14 years ago, there was a young man that came and he sat right there. His sister came up to me and told me, said, this is the first time that I could remember him being in a church since he was a kid. I think he was 36 at the time. And he cried the entire service. Tears would just run down his face. Two weeks later, I got a phone call that he had had a brain aneurysm and died. 36 years old. Perfect health. Good looking guy. And just that quick, his life was gone. His family called me and said, you have no idea the shift that took place. Nobody ever has promised you tomorrow. Nobody. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, preaching or somewhere in that vicinity. And I was on the way home to preach his funeral. And I was going to do a, just a regular funeral service. And the Lord got to dealing with me and said, don't you dare do that. Don't go in there and preach it. He said, you go in there and preach it like you're supposed to preach it. And I gave an altar call at that young man's funeral when they heard the story. And from that side of the stage to this side was full, all around the casket. Over 50 people came to know Christ that morning. Listen, I don't want you to shout about that. I want you to shout. I want you to pray because I'm not trying to scare you, but... Somebody, God is dealing with somebody in this room. I don't care about your agenda. When somebody's life is in the gap. If we're not about seeing souls saved, we should throw church out the door. For some of you super spiritual people, let me help you out. The only reason you was given the power of the Holy Ghost was to help you be a witness unto people. Not for you to come in here and shout and feel good and roll. And listen, I'm all for that too. But the fact is, you was given the power of the Holy Ghost according to the scripture to be a witness unto men. Not just to make you feel good. Something is moving in this room.
and I feel a burden for somebody and I, I don't want to move until I can be sure that I don't miss it. Is that all right? Can you just begin to pray all over this place? I'm, I'm not trying to embarrass you because I promise you I will love on you and not judge you beyond anything. I don't care where you come from. There's something wrong with churches when they judge people. There's something wrong with you spiritually when you judge people. Nobody's perfect, including me with the microphone. God, I'm begging you. Let them feel the love of God like they've never felt before. God, at this moment, God, let them feel your presence. Or for some reason in their mind, they don't think they can hold up to what it means to be a Christian. What they don't realize, God, is that you didn't ask them to come perfect. You just asked them to come. God, you never told the disciples to be perfect. You told them, come follow me. Whew. All you ever said was to come, follow me. Because, Lord, we understand that as long as we're with you, Lord, that we can overcome anything in this life. I just want to walk with you, God. And whoever's in this room at this present time, Lord, I pray right now, wrap the love of God around them. Let them feel you like they've never felt the presence before. If that's you, all I'm asking you, let me pray with you. Let me help you meet the Savior that changed my life and so many others. You don't have to be ashamed of where you came from because you have no idea what God is going to do with you in your life. This ain't one of those days I'm just asking you to raise your hand because that's not going to be enough. This is one of them days you're going to have to step out by faith and come down here and say, I'm ready to change. Heavenly Father, fill this room. Fill this room. Listen, if some of you Christians feel like you haven't felt the love of God before, I really feel like God's love is pouring out in this place right now. Come on, if you ain't felt the love of God in a while, I just want you to lift your hands to heaven because there's something happening in this place right now. Come on, if you just want to feel the love of God, just lift your hands to heaven. I, if you don't want to feel it, don't lift it. I'm not begging you today. But if you just want to feel a fresh touch from God, God, I'm praying let your love fill this room. Let your presence fill this place. Or maybe some of us have lost a little faith. Maybe some of us, God, we've been going through a hard time and been too busy just to get into the presence of God. But Lord, right now, Lord, I feel the presence of God in this place. Lord, I feel the presence of God in this place. Woo. Feel this room, oh God. Oh, come on, that's it. Just bask in the presence of God for a moment.
just say that one more time. He loves us. God loves you in this place. Would you give him a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Would you get out of your seat? Go speak to somebody. Tell somebody good morning. Comes to a wonderful time in our service, amen, when we get to bless the Lord and give back to Him. Are you there? So, Lord put a thought in my heart. I've never used this for an offering in my life that I can recall, but there's something the Lord wants us to see. In 2 Samuel, I think it's chapter 
24 roughly, David did something that kings were never to do. In the book of Kings, or a manual that Samuel put together for kings, kings were never to number the people. They were never to know how many military men they had because that would put their faith in their might and not in the Lord's might. And that chapter, 2 Samuel 30, 24, starts off with uh, David calling his mighty men together, his captains, and saying, go number Israel. All of his captains didn't want to do it. Joab, the main one, said, no, king, we can't do this, we can't do this. You know that's not right. And in his irritation, David told them to do that anyway. In the midst of this, the prophet Gad came to David and said, you know you've done wrong. You know what the book says. You know what the God of glory has told you. And David repented and, and, and said, I, I, I'm sorry, what, what, what should I do? And Gad gave him three choices. You can either run from your enemies, be hunted down by your enemies. I think it's seven months, roughly something like that. Or there could be a famine in the land. Or I can send a plague. And David did a very smart thing. He told Gad, he said, I'm going to put my trust in the mercy of the Lord. And when he did, the angel of death began to go through Israel. If I'm not mistaken, it's roughly 70,000 people died in just a few moments going through Israel. When leaders make big mistakes, it causes bad things, right? And we've all heard a heart after God. David did indeed have that heart. He understood God's mercy, but he messed up. And while he's seeing what's going on, he sees the angel of death going across the land. And all of a sudden, as the angel of death gets right to a certain place, before he goes on in Jerusalem, God stops him. That's enough. And it was at a place called Othaniel's threshing floor. If you don't know what a threshing floor is, when they would bring wheat in, it would be rocks and everything there, and they would step around on that to break the chaff off the wheat. They would take a winnowing fan, and they'd throw the wheat up in the air and the chaff, and the wind would blow the chaff away. In Scripture... The threshing floor is always big with God. Even Jesus was prophesied that his winnowing fan is with him to allow us to be threshed and the chaff of our lives blown off. So he comes there. David loads up and goes to Othaniel. That's one translation of his name. And, and says, that he sees him coming. He says, oh, king, what can I do for you? What do you need? I need to make sacrifice unto the Lord. And this, and this Othaniel guy was a king. He was a king of the Jebusites. And so he says to King David, he says, well, okay, I've got all these calves here. I got all these bulls. I got all, everything for sacrifice. I will give you this threshing floor. And David said one statement that I've always remembered. He said, no. I cannot offer to God something that does not cost me. If it doesn't cost me, it's not a true offering from me. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you do. And he paid the man 50 shekels of silver, bought the threshing floor, bought 50, I think, cattle it was for an offering, and made offering unto God. Now here's the amazing thing. Do you know that it is that same exact spot that Solomon would later build the temple of the Lord on? There's a lot in that. We can't go all there because he'll run me off. Okay? So we can't do all that. But here's the point. It's another precedence that what you give and how you give and how deeply it affects you is the foundation stone for the house of God in your life. For the work of God, the blessing of God, the abundance of God. And what I'm saying to you this morning, 
regardless of what you do or don't believe about tithing or offerings or giving, I'm telling you this morning, if you can give where it affects you, like Jesus said, the rich man can come and put in all kinds of money. The little widow might come in and put two mites. And her offering is greater than the rich man. Why? Because it didn't hurt the rich man. It didn't dig into something that he was going to miss. But now that little widow lady, those two mites was probably all she had for that week. My point is today, wherever you are, whatever you need, David just wanted to thank God that he stopped the slaughter that David caused. He begged for mercy, God gave it, and so to reward, to bless the Lord, he offered something that cost him. Have you received mercy? Has the blood of the Lamb cleansed you and washed you? Have your bondages been broken? The things that came against you? I was shooting up when I got saved. Two and three times a day, every stinking day. I'd start off the morning sticking a needle in my own arm with meth or coke, whichever I had at the time, to live my life. And Jesus came into a county jail in Houston, Texas, and I said, you got to fix me or kill me. I can't keep living like this. If he'd have killed me, he'd been justified. Because I meant it. Kill me or fix me. That was my sinner's prayer. And when I did that, right there in a, a county jail with 68 to 70 some odd men in there for all kinds of things, the peace of God instantly came in. The bondage was broken. And for the next almost two years in prison, he protected me, he kept me, he helped me, he made himself real to me. The love pastor talked about that. I'd feel the love of God in a prison with prisoners all around and begin to weep because of his great goodness. You've maybe experienced that. And so if you have, I challenge you this morning. Would you stand? I challenge you to give because he's worthy. He's worthy. And there's something about giving, praising, loving, thanking. I've given many an offering in my life that hurt. And I wonder, how am I going to make this work? Amen? If you want to see God move, take five. But if you want to see God move, be grateful. Give of your heart, your life. Amen? So, Father, we come. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for what your servant David said, that he would trust your mercy and he would not give you anything that didn't cost him. And so, Father, today we come and we gather in your house and we offer up an offering to you, whether it be a tithe or an offering or an abundant offering or something that we're thanking you for or something we're believing you towards. Father, thank you right now as you move upon the hearts. Anchor this truth. Anchor these truths of how good you are and how worthy and build a house of God in us and together as Breakthrough Nation. Build a house of God here from the giving, the gratefulness, the prayer, the praise, the faith, and everything that we do. And everybody that agreed for that said, Amen. You're going to make it. God's going to see you through. Hold your head up. Put a smile on your face This is another test children. <laughs> Hallelujah. The inheritance of the Lord, the blessing. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand with me? And let's pray. Stretch out a hand towards these little ones. Amen? The next generation of preachers and prophetesses and musicians and praisers. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for how you cause us 
to bring forth the fruit of the womb and to have children and grandchildren. We thank you for allowing us to experience parenting, grandparenting. Thank you for what you've done. And so, Father, we pray for these little ones. We pray for their hearts and their minds, that you would anchor something within them, a seed of your presence, a seed of your word, a seed of truth that will never leave them or forsake them, and that they would be trained in the way that you want them to go, Lord, so as they grow, they will become stronger, wiser, more spiritual, more wanting of you. So, Father, we bless these children and the teachers that are training them today. May your spirit be real and your touch be great. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's amazing. Those kids already know what part of service is that they can take off. <laughs> Praise Lord. Everybody doing good? Amen. I see there's a lot out today. Pray for their salvation. I'm just, I'm just kidding. The... Uh, Open your Bibles back to 2 Peter chapter 1. I, uh, it's a couple people kind of noticed that I was getting a little upset last week when some people wasn't getting some of this. There's so much in it that uh, I had to kind of go back to it because I don't think I was done with it. And so uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we don't realize that God has a lot more that he wants to do that we don't. And we kind of take it for granted. Uh, before I get there, I better do two or three announcements. Number one, uh, today at two o'clock, some of you men, if you want to brave your skills, uh, today at two o'clock, they're going to play a little paintball down at Red Fox Games. So uh, Red Fox is over towards my house. Uh, so at 2 o'clock today, all the men playing paintball, uh, be it Red Fox. Is that what it is, Joel? It's, it's Red Fox game. Is that what it is? So if you want to play some paintball, they're going to be there, and you can test your paintball skills. To be honest with you, I've never paintballed in my life. That's It's going to probably be a first for me. Uh, I ain't never played with fake bullets too much. So, uh the, uh, but anyway, that's at 2 o'clock. This evening at 6 o'clock at my house, uh, we are going to, uh, I got a grill out, and we're going to eat and grub together. So you men come, and, and if I look a little tired, it's because some guys came to my house last night, and we watched that UFC fight till about 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, so uh, I had drank a pot of coffee before to stay awake because I'm so used to going to bed early. And so I really didn't go to bed till like 4 o'clock, so I'm, I'm a little struggling today. This old man can't do that young stuff no more as much. But, um, and, uh, so, uh, and then I, I need y'all to have a prayer, too, before I begin. Uh, Mike McCollichek is going to need some prayer. He tried to beat up your pastor last night, and uh, he got to watching things and got a little carried away. I think his emotions got the better of him. <laughs> I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Y'all better pray for him because I'm going to get a mat. And he's going down to the mat. And so, the, uh, no, nah, I'm just, I'm not kidding. I'm going to get him. It's all right to laugh in church, people. It's okay to have a little fun. Is that all right? And so, don't forget, and the main, the, the, there's one more important thing I'm going to get before I get. I know I'm going to forget it, so I'm going to tell you. Next Sunday, everybody say next Sunday. I have to be at church. Like three people said it. Say so next Sunday. It's real easy, people. I have to be at church if I want to eat. We're having a picnic right after church in the parking lot. So uh, if you want to be here in, in next Sunday, you're going to get to eat some food together and fellowship together. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do, guys, a lot of times people say, when uh, we, we have a 
pretty much breakthrough is going through a shift. And, and it's not a bad shift, it's a good shift. Uh, and when people begin, there's a lot of new people here at Breakthrough, a lot of old people, a lot of new people. And so before any team can go do a, a if you go in the military, anybody been, been in the military? You'll never get a military team to go out and do a mission until they first come together as a team. And churches are the same way. You have to come together. And you got to love each other and, and love, learn to grow with each other. And so that's, it's an important part of church fellowship. That's the reason Jesus hung out at weddings and funerals. Because that's when people fellowship. And so we're trying to get people to come together, get the, uh, people to know each other. Uh, because you need people. I know some of you say, I don't need nobody. Yeah, you do. You're just lying to yourself. Uh, you need people. And it amazes me how church people don't want to be friends with people. We have more division in church on Sunday morning than ever. And we call ourselves Christians. Every Sunday morning, we have Christians that are divided by denominations. Over a few stupid doctrinal differences. Uh, um, you can say, man, this is the truth. It's little small differences that really won't make a difference. Some of them will. I mean, there's some crazy denominations out there. The second thing is racial and cultural. And if you can't go to church with people in, on earth, how are you going to do it when you get to heaven? You're going to say, well, I'm only going to hang out with my people when I get to heaven. And God's going to look at you and say, you understand nothing about my kingdom. Because the moment you get saved, you became a citizen of heaven and no longer a citizen of your race. Are we all right? And, and so it bothers me because every Sunday we see churches are split. We have a church over here and a church over here and a church over here, and, but we don't understand kingdom. And I could preach a whole sermon on that, but I'm not. And so what we're trying to do is have kingdom here at this church and, and be a part of the kingdom of God and, and experience the kingdom of God. And that means that if you're going to be in the kingdom, it has people in the kingdom. I've never seen a kingdom that was by itself. If a king is by himself, he's really not a king. He's just a person. Oh, yeah, all right. So, uh, anyway, uh, I, I want you to understand to go off of that is that, how many of you know that, that one day there's going to be a judgment? And, and the scripture is very clear that some of us that, yeah, you're saved, you're going to make it to heaven, but, but at that day, there's going to be a judgment. And you're going to be judged off your works. You're going to be judged off the things that you have done. And the things, the Bible even says, you'll be judged off the outer words that you said according to Matthew. Even Psalms, David even said that there will be a great day of judgment. And you will be judged on your works. And so it amazes me that church people that just come to church think, well, uh, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's great you're going to heaven we all hope to go to heaven but what is it going to say about you that day when you're judged I went, you went to church every Sunday bless your heart how many people did you walk by and you never spoke to you didn't even get along with the people in the church you never, you worked with guys for years that needed Jesus, but you never told them they needed Jesus. Am I all right? Let's just don't take the one part of Christianity and think, well, we're all trying to get to heaven. The Bible talks about there's going to be a bunch to get there and they're going to barely make it. But I believe that you're going to see it. I think your life is going to be put on judgment in front of everybody. And I think you'll be judged based on your works. I'm not saying you're not going to get in, but I think that anything God ever planted, he expected it to produce. And when he created you, he created you with a purpose and a potential. Is that, you believe that? You were created with a purpose and a potential, and when you stand before God, he's going to look at your life just like that tree that produces apples and say it never produced what it was supposed to produce. I created you for this. 
but this is what you've done. I made you to do this, but you didn't really do that. You did this. And one of the first revelations I got when I got saved, I said, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do. I just want you to be with me. So I never just wanted to be a Christian that just stood on the sidelines. I mean, there's too many Christians that we like being spectators, but we don't want to play the game. Come on now. It's like this, that you can be on a team, but you don't want to go to workouts. You, you can be on the team, but you don't want to commit like everybody else is committed. And see, I, I have a hard time. I'm going there. Just give me some minute. Is that all right? It, it, how much, what time is it? Oh, I got 33 minutes. You, you can survive 33 minutes. See, I, I still have a military mindset on everything and every part of my life. And I struggle sometimes being around men that don't have that same kind of mentality. Because I realize that I don't make it if somebody else beside me don't make it. There, Rambo is a movie. But it's not real life. And for some of y'all don't know what Rambo is, let me help you out. Because I just got a feeling some people don't get movie references around here no more. Rambo was a one-man army. And that's a false narrative because there's no such thing as a one-man army. Even King David had somebody around him and it depends on how they acted and how he acted to determine. If you look at David when he went into the cave of Dulem, that he was sitting there surrounded by people that the Bible said were distressed, depressed, and complaining. Matter of fact, he said they were in debt too. So not only that, they were complaining and they were broke. And you ever notice that most people that are broke are always complaining? And sometimes you have to be the leader to shift the atmosphere. You, you have to be the leader that changes the environment. Because there's one thing I know for sure. Church people love to hang around people that complain. And, I, and I'll tell you something for some of you that don't know me very well. The moment you start complaining around me, my circle gets small. Oh, my Jesus. If I take you to the book of Numbers, when the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, the first people that God killed was those that were murmuring and complaining. Oh, you Go back and read your Bible. Don't get mad at me. Because you know why? Because murmuring and complaining is contagious. So you have to understand, as Christians, we need to change atmospheres. Are we all right? So last week I started telling you that everything in God is already in you. The moment you got saved, everything in God is in you. So some of you ain't getting it. Pastor, you talking about me? I'm talking about you. The moment you got saved, the seed of potential that everything God had for you is in you. I'm going to say that again because some of you ain't got it yet. Everything God had for you, the moment you got saved, is in you. Matter of fact, it was really in you before you got saved. You just can't activate it until you get saved. That's why the Bible says, you got to understand this, everything begins at birth. The moment you get saved, you have to be born again. Everything begins at birth. Everybody got that? It's, it's a power because we have to understand that we connect to people. And, and, and so uh, I, I'm going to go a little bit different this morning and I'm going to bring it back to last week because my wife was so, she said, I'm so proud of you because you did it the teaching the right way. I said, baby, you do know I went to school and got a master's to learn how to do that. I, she said, well, you just don't do it every week. I told her, you go and critique your teachers at your school. Don't do that to me on a Sunday. So, Lord, I'm asking you right now, let me be a good teacher in this place. Let me teach to reach somebody's heart, God, not just to be in a pulpit for a show. God, let me teach this morning, God, that somebody would get a revelation of change. Let somebody shift in their mind and let their hearts follow. 
In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. My boys laugh at me because sometimes I joke and say, uh, it ain't really a joke. I really say it because I mean it. I said, that person's got a good heart. Because you can be the most talented person in the world and not have a good heart. And, and they kind of have little jokes about, and, and, oh, that, he's got a good heart. Them good people, them good people. Because that's what I say. Because I've seen people that are talented that had a terrible heart. I've seen people that are gifted that had a terrible heart. I've seen people that have money that have a terrible heart. I've seen preachers. Who is quiet in here? And, and so last week I began to tell you that, that just like everything else, your, your body needs nutrients and stuff. It needs something to change. It needs something to add to you and sometimes to enhance you. And the Bible begins to tell us with Peter that Peter was trying to tell you things to enhance your faith. Now, I want you to understand this if I'm teaching biblically to you and trying to get you to understand the scripture. In 1 Peter, Peter, everything in 1 Peter, y'all still with me? Is it all right if we learn some Bible and then I'll preach at you? Everything in 1 Peter it was out about the outward, oppressions, uh, th outward oppressors that come into your life, things that oppress you from the outside. 1 Peter, if you read 1 Peter, everybody knows this 1st and 2nd Peter. In 1 Peter, if you read through 1 Peter, he is dealing with everything from the outside in. Don't let the things outside come at you. In 2 Peter, he changes and starts dealing with the Christians and says, now you got to deal with the inside out. Y'all get that? Everybody with me? Say amen something. Say we're here. I, I exist. Uh, I, I had uh, breakfast with Albert this week, and he said, I could tell Pastor, you was getting frustrated because people weren't getting it. And I said, I think they were asleep. So y'all wait this morning. Pinch your neighbor. Just say, okay, it's, it's, we give you permission. Just pinch your neighbor. So Second Peter chapter 1. He said, Simon Peter, a bond servant, and a, and a, an apostle of Jesus Christ and who uh, have attained like precious faith with us the righteousness our God and Savior Jesus Christ grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life God's power has given us all things that pertain to life everybody see that in the scripture and godliness and through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. So God has given us divine promises. Everybody in here, God has given you divine promises. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So God, he, Peter begins to tell him this. He said, listen. He said, God has given you divine promises. Everything that, that God wants you to have is in you. God's given it to you. And he gave it to you that you could escape the lust of the world. In other words, that you just don't chase money. If you don't just chase fame and materialistic things. It's not saying those things are bad, but he's saying that you're not chasing those first. But everything that you need, God put in you. Are we all right? But also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith. Everybody said, I can add to my faith? You understand that? You can add to your faith. So faith is a very important thing because we, it takes faith to believe in God. It, it takes faith for us to move. And be honest with you, I, I love it and I've preached this for many, many years because to be honest with you, the only way that you can actually uh, bless God is by faith. The only way you can please God is by faith. That's what the scripture says. The only way you can really get God's attention is by 
faith. So uh, I, I began to teach you this last week, and, and, and I'm going to kind of make sure I go through this again. But can I get you there first? Uh, there, uh, many, many years ago, I got to go all over Europe. And, and while I was in the military, I got to travel a whole lot. And, and some of you have probably seen the Tower of Pisa. Anybody ever seen it? Anybody ever seen a picture of it? Lord of mercy, y'all. <laughs> Help me out a little bit. And what people don't realize, engineering-wise, it really uh, is it, a remarkable thing. What people don't realize, uh, but what, what some people have not studied and, and seen is that really it was supposed to fall in 2007. It was actually fallen at one twentieth of an inch every year. It was falling. Every year it was falling one twentieth of an inch. So eventually, if you keep tilting one twentieth of an inch and you're 179 feet tall, you would assume it's going to fall. And for something that's 800 years old, it's amazing that it didn't fall earlier. It's not that it's not a great architectural piece. It's just there's something wrong. And so really when you look at the word Tower of Pisa, it's, really, it's, it's almost funny because the word Pisa means... Marshy ground. Did you know that? It means marshy ground. So really what was wrong with it, it was built on a marshy foundation. Some of you ain't got that yet. It was built on a marshy foundation. It means it doesn't matter how great this is of a piece of architecture, if the foundation is wrong, if the foundation is messed up, everything else is wrong. So finally, they realized this thing, and, and they, they spent $30 million to go in back many, many years ago and re-engineer it. And they had to start with the soul. And one of the things they did is they took the water out of the wells because it was the water that was messing with it. I ain't got you there yet because some of y'all ain't paying attention, but uh, I'm going to get you there. The fact of the matter is, everybody in here, is, is the one thing I'm having a problem with is you're going to grow old. But just sometimes just because you're growing old doesn't mean you're growing up. We still got a bunch of babies in church. And just because you had birth or you were born again doesn't mean that you stopped growing. As a Christian, the moment you get saved, you have to continue to grow. And it bothers me because if you don't understand the foundation of what Peter is trying to teach, then you're really what you have done is you have stopped growing. So Peter teaches us a certain way, and y'all can give me my uh, thing now if you don't mind. Thank you. So I I'm going to make it easy on you this week, okay? And I want you to imagine this as a pyramid, okay? Let's go back to your text. Is everybody, if you got a Bible or if you don't fake it and act like you got it on your phone. Verse 5. He said, but also for this very reason, given all diligence, add to your faith. So we have to add to faith. And the first thing he said is, is that you must have virtue. You got to understand, I told you this last week. I'm going to make sure you get it this week. Each one, each precept is built upon the previous precept. You can't go from this one to the last one. Are y'all still with me? So as I go through these, you can't just skip to the very end. You got to go through each one. He said, from, to build and add to your faith, you got to add virtue. Virtue also means morals. I know people that have better morals than Christians. I, I know Christian business owners that have no ethics. I have a friend that, that had a, his parent, he saw his dad kill his mom at a very young age, then he went to Afghanistan, and he has no religious beliefs, but he loves me. 
But I will tell you this, he has better morals than most Christian people that I know. It's amazing that Peter puts this in the plan because he said, just because you have faith doesn't mean you have virtues and you have moral. So you have to increase your morals and your virtue. Am, am I all right? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, listen, this one I'm going to make you learn. He said, then you go from virtue to knowledge. But you got to understand something. Just because you have knowledge don't also mean you have wisdom. But you have to get knowledge. So many, many years ago, about 15 years ago, I preached a lesson called The Seven Processes to Change. And, and I taught this inside of that, that in the only way that you change is through information. <clears throat> Without information, it's impossible to change. Are we all right? Somebody tell me amen, just act like you're with me. Are y'all with me? Without information, you can't change. That's why when you get old like me, you say, man, if I'd only known then what I know now, I'd be really rich. The difference between then and now is I got information that I did not have back then when I was young. I, I got older and I started listening instead of talking. So to add to your faith, virtue, you got to have morals. And then he says, after morals, you got to have knowledge. In other words, I have to get knowledge and the best place to get knowledge is through the Bible. And if I don't get knowledge, how can I grow? <clears throat> if the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God, then I also know that the only way I can get faith is through the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the... Am I all right? Am I going too fast? Am I going too fast? Are we okay? Just shake, nod or something, act like you're asleep. So if I'm going to grow in knowledge, i got to grow in the Word of God. That means I have to read my Bible and not just listen to somebody else preach all the time. And then from knowledge, self-control. You know what he says? Because now you're not going to do anything until you get some self-control. You need to know how to act. You need to know how to control your mouth. You need to know how to discipline yourself. Self-control is important because I know a lot of people that don't have self-control. You can have self-control with this, but struggle over here. Last night I ordered pizza for the guy. And you know how hard it was not to eat that pizza? Self-control. And, and, and Peter goes on to say now from self-control to perseverance. So now that you can control yourself, then you need to keep moving. You got to be committed. Perseverance means I keep moving. I'm persevere. I'm committed. There's studies been done that, that Christians are some of the worst committed people ever. Oh, there's no amens in this place. I, I've been in church long enough to know that I love it because people say, God sent me here. Three months later, God changed his opinion. God didn't shift his opinion. You have a problem with commitment. Why is the divorce rate three times higher now than it was in 1960? Because people don't understand the difference between commitment. They, they, don't, they think they're committed, but they don't understand what the word commitment means. They don't understand the difference between commitment and a feeling. And church people, especially Pentecostal church people, we love to go by feeling instead of commitment. Commitment means I do it whether I feel like it or not. Commitment means I, I, I have to get up because uh, I know that if I don't, my family's going to starve. Oh, it's quiet. It's all right. Y'all can act Catholic. They talk more than y'all do. So from perseverance, and this is as I told you this last week, but I want to make sure you get it. The fifth thing, if precept is upon precept, he finally gets to godliness. Now get this now. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance. 
And in the middle, I'm talking about being rock solid because I'm talking about foundation, right? He, he said, now, godliness. Now, I would have probably said in my younger days, godliness should have been first. But Peter's telling the church, saying, listen, you're not godly until you do these other ones. If you're going to add to your faith, you got to do this first, and then you become godly. Godliness means I act and look like God. If we're citizens of the kingdom, then we're representing the king of kings. Are we all right? So we should look and act like God acts. He said, now we get to godliness. This is the foundation from which I am trying to build the church. Peter has shifted from worrying about things on the outside because he realized things on the outside can't change you. Things on the inside will. And sometimes we miss it because we don't understand that it's all about growing in who God is. He said, now that you become godly, he said, now you got to show brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. That means I can't go off on the waitress when she don't bring my water on time. I, I can't be the meanest one at work. I love the word meek. When you really study out the word meek in the, the Hebrew and Greek, it's a very, very powerful word because it actually really means that you have the strength to do it, but you restrain yourself. I heard one theologian write it that it was almost comparing uh, to the, the, uh, the Roman horses for chariots because if you don't know it, a horse has the strength to do it, but the bridle controls it. And the meekness basically means that you can control everything that God has given you. Brotherly kindness shouldn't be something you have to work at. Because if you've done the first five, you'd already have it. Brotherly kindness shouldn't be something that I got to just go out here and say, I, I got to work on it. Because now it comes back to, do you have a good heart? Do, do you really have the heart of Jesus? Do you have love like Jesus loved? And then the very last thing he says is, is to love. The word love here is not just the normal word of love. It's actually the word agape love. And if you've never stood agape love, it's not based on conditions. It's just what you do. Agape love means that you do it because that's just who you are. Jesus is agape love. You can't understand God if you don't understand agape love. Agape love is the love that God has for us that despite our faults and failures and what we've done, he still loves us. Not based on a condition of how good we are. It's almost been messed up because we taught people in churches that God only loved you if you did everything right. I'm preaching better than you, amen, and I can promise you that. If you're watching online, at least give a comment. So, so we, we get into the form that if we're going to be like Jesus and we're going to add to our faith, Peter says, listen, Peter's talking to the church folk. This is what you have to do to add to your faith. You can't just say, I got saved and I'm going to heaven. You can't just say, I, I come to church and everything's all right. No, what Peter says, if you're going to grow in God, you got to do these things. If your faith is going to build and you're going to increase in what God is trying to do in your life, you got to do these things because if you don't have this foundation, you're going to fail. You're going to be like this tower that was built, but yet it still leans. 
And, and when I started thinking about this, you start looking that there's a lot of church people that lean. Unfortunately, you don't have somebody that has $30 million to come rebuild your structure. And, and I really want to go deep into it because they not only took the water out of the, uh, out of the ground, they began to change the dirt that was underneath it to try to rebuild the structure just to get it back to its original point. They had to take a cable system and everything else to pull it back the other direction. There were so many things that they had to do, and I almost look at it, that's how Christians are. That sometimes we got to go back because the foundation that we were taught was wrong. Sometimes the foundation that our parents give us may not have been right. But I, I want to give you a couple more things before I keep going. Is that all right? No, let, let me give you the scripture first. Verse 7. He said, from godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, love. Are y'all in the text? Y'all awake? I, I'm in mean this morning, but I want you to get this. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, if you have these seven things right here, these seven things will make you a fruitful person. That means that if you have these seven things, you will completely, you're not going to be a barren, you will always have fruit. When you get to heaven, I'm hoping you're going to have some fruit when you get judged. If you have these things, Peter says, you're no longer going to be barren and you won't be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ for uh, he who lacks these things is short-sighted. Peter said, if you don't have these, you're blinded. I'm going to say that again because I'm trying to give you the scripture. He said, he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Peter says, if you don't have, can you give me back my chart? If you don't have faith, if you don't have some kind of morals and if you don't have knowledge and you don't have self-control and you don't have perseverance and you don't have godliness and you don't have brotherly kindness and you don't have a love, then guess what? You're going to be barren. He said, if you don't have these things, you're not going to be fruitful. He said, even you will forget. That's what I love. If you don't have these things, you will forget of what you were forgiven for. And that's what scares me with Christians. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure for you do these things. He says, if you do these things, you won't stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I, I want to give you a couple of things. Number one, I want you to write this down if you can. Principles about growth has nothing to do with age. Doesn't matter just because you're old. Because sometimes there's wise folk that are young. Well, what it has to do is that you can grow as what, much as you want, but you've got to have the number one thing. This is number one if you want to grow. And I'm going to relate it to a business concept. If you're going to grow, you've got to have an investor. In our situation, our investor is God. If I'm going to grow, I got to make sure I have the right investor. And my investor is God. You're saying, what do you mean by that? It's, it's like this. You can come up to me and I can write you a check today for $1 million. 
Sounds good, don't it? How many would like a check today for one million dollars? Well, I could write you a check today for one million dollars. The problem is, is that when you get down to Arthur State Bank, they're going to look at you and say, this check is no good. Now, I, I know some friends of mine that, 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 that could write that check. They have real money. But if you go down to Arthur State Bank and, and I wrote you that check, there's no funds that's going to cover that. Not yet. But what I'm trying to tell you is that it's because I don't have the right money to do it. I can't back what I say. But God is an investor that can back anything that he says. Come on, you, you follow me here? If God says it can be done, I, then he can write the check. So what I'm saying is you got to have the right investor. If you're going to shift in your life, you have to have God in your life. If I'm going to grow, I've got to invest in myself. And the only way I can invest in myself is through God. Because that shifts me. Is this all right? It's the shift. The second part of this, and I'm only giving you two, is, is that then you got to worry about building codes. Let me know building codes can mess with you. But what building codes do is this. They make sure that you have the right foundation. I remember when we built this building that they had somebody from building the codes come out and check every batch of concrete coming out of the truck. They had an engineer out here that was doing a test on every batch of concrete. You know why? Because they understand that if the foundation is not right. It's only in church that we don't worry about foundation. That's why it's so important when these kids come up here that they get the right foundation. That, that's why it's so important in how we raise our kids that they get the right foundation. So why is it different when you get saved? you got to make sure you grow on the right foundation. And then if we continue to grow, we got to have these things because let me tell you about foundations. There's some foundations, number one, or this is under 2A. But 2A, you can do 2A. I'll give it to you like a class. Is you can have a faulty foundation. Let me know that. A faulty foundation, and sometimes some of us have faulty faith. You say you have faith, but you don't know who God really is. You say you have faith, but according to Peter, is if you don't have these seven things, you really don't have, you're not growing in your faith. So you have faulty faith. If you're not growing in these seven things, then Peter says, your faith is still here. It's a faulty faith. There's some church folk that have some faulty faith. Then there's some of us, this is 2B. 2B is this. Is that, are y'all feeling better? I'm giving you numbers and letters and all that good stuff. It's for y'all OCD people. 2B is a firm foundation. Everybody wants a firm foundation because that's what we need. We talk about stony ground and, and, and bad ground, but we need a firm foundation to build our life. And for most of you, you're thinking, but Pastor, that's what we need the firm foundation. That's everything. Not according to the scripture. See, number three, he talks about a flowing foundation. He said, Pastor, what do you mean by flowing? That's 2C. I'm sorry, 2C. The flowing foundation is, he said, out of me flows rivers of living water. 
My faith is so strong that out of me, my foundation is so strong, what Jesus told them, out of me flows rivers of living water. Because if you built on the firm foundation, then you ain't got to worry about it because you know now you can flow. That's why Paul says, I'm poured out as a drink offering. I just don't want to be here. I want to affect everybody else. See, some of you want to be the firm foundation. You just want to sit there and stand like a tree. But if you got the right foundation in Christ, you want to keep flowing. You want to keep moving. You want to keep, am I all right? Am I teaching anybody? So uh, I'm going to go back. My wife's going to be happy. I'm going to do this the teaching way. I did tell her, I said, baby, you do realize I have a master from Clemson in teaching. I can actually do this. She said, yeah, but you don't. So. This is what Peter says. David, can you give me something? Because I won't shut up. Oh, it's 12.02. Some of y'all's stomachs already grumbling. Think you got to go somewhere. This is what Peter says. If you want to expand your faith, if you're going to expand your faith, you got to have morals. You got to be virtuous. Listen, you, some of this you can go home and study for yourself. I can't give you every definition. Go home. I, I, I encourage you. Don't ever trust me anyway. Go home and study. I, I'm one of them preachers to tell you that. Don't ever trust everything I say. Go home and look it up. He says, if you're going to expand your faith, you've got to have virtue, you've got to have morals. And then he says, then you've got to have, for morals, you've got to go to knowledge. I've got to have knowledge. The knowledge of Jesus Christ is what I need. And then I go from knowledge to understanding I've got to have self-control. You know one of the hardest things to work on? is self-control. Self-control. Then he says, Peter says, if you're going to go for self-control, now you've got to go to perseverance. You've got to commit. That means when I go through the valley, I'm still committed. <laughs> when I go to the mountaintop, I'm still committed. When I pe don't meet people I don't like, I'm still committed. Just because it ain't the way I wanted it at church, I'm still, oh my God. Ooh, that boy's preaching this morning. I don't care. Amen, preacher Mike. Amen, pastor. Preach. Amen, myself. Even when I don't feel like it, I have to be committed. I got to persevere. I got to keep pushing. If I'm going to expand my faith, I got to keep pushing. And then all of a sudden... I start becoming godly. I start acting like God. I start looking like God. You know what it really means? I start looking right in God's eyes. You, you put on the mind of Christ. That, that's a scripture if you don't know that. Let me help you out. Put on the mind of Christ. Be you transformed by the renewing of the mind. I start thinking like God wants me to think. I start becoming like God wants me to become. So I have right standing with God. So you're trying to tell me, Pastor, I got to do all these things before I get right standing with God? I'm telling you what Peter said. That if you're going to expand your faith, you got to do these things. And then after you get this, after you get this, you can work on some brotherly kindness. And then you'll know you got it when you can love people. You know you got it when you can love. Not based on color of skin, not based on what you came from in your culture, but loving people you don't even like. My family, this is nothing I won't tell you from the pulpit. You can ask my family. I don't use the word hate. Don't use it. 
you will never hear me say I hate somebody. Because in my spirit, I feel like I'm saying if I hate somebody, then God did it wrong. So you can ask any of my kids. I won't say that word. I will never say I hate somebody. There's only two people in my life I can say I strongly disliked. Only two. Ain't many people can say that either. And my wife says it's a fault because I see the good in people more than I see the bad. And if somebody's been around me enough, y'all know that is a little true. Because while everybody else is trying to find the wrong thing about you, I'm looking for the one thing that's good about you. Because the way I say it is, is that one day God looked at me and he looked at you and he said, I love him despite his stupidity. I love him despite of all the dumb things he's done. And if you're going to love me, you got to love the same way. I wish you could understand what I'm trying to teach you this morning. That you have to have a love for people and a love for people around you. Even when they're not perfect. Lord, has anybody been around perfect people your whole life? You know where it's the hardest thing is when you're in your own house. Some of us didn't grow up with perfect parents. We didn't grow up with perfect loved ones. I mean, we have children that's been abused in, in, our, in our cultures. We have people that's grown up in terrible backgrounds. But God says, if you can love. I love Pastor Bill Wilson. Some of you don't know who that is. Pastor Bill Wilson, I love him because he has a love that just makes no sense to me. He'll fight you. The thing that changed my wife and I's life is when we read his book, Whose Child Is This? And the reason he loves kids so much because when he was eight years old, he was left on a street corner. He was left on a street corner. His mom said, I'll be back. And he waited for three days and she never showed up. And a man from church saw him sitting there and finally he pulled up one day. He said, son, are you okay? He said, I'm waiting on my mom. He said, I've been sitting there, I hadn't ate, I hadn't drank, I hadn't done anything. I've sat there for three days. And the man took me in, sent me to a church camp. And I found Jesus. He said, so the reason I do what I do, if you've never looked up his ministry in New York, the reason he has 250,000 kids around the world and 22,000, 25,000 in New York is because he said, every time I see a kid, I see me. The kid that was left on the corner. One Christmas Eve, my wife will tell you this, I got a phone call. It's one of the greatest things in my life because I felt it was an honor. Because every Christmas Eve, he goes back to that same street and he sits on a bucket to remember. And he reflects all night long and he called me. He said, There's, I don't call him many people, but he called me and said, I want you to know, man, I'm praying for you. I love you. He said, I'm sitting here on my bucket. See, that man has expanded his faith because he did this. He has a love that makes no sense. I, I, I remember one time somebody, they, they come in and they give him a, a Mercedes. He says, okay. He walks in and throws the keys to the staff and he goes, go sell that junk, get some for the kids. You don't care about money. He travels enough every year to raise 13 to $14 million a year for his kids. The only thing he used to buy himself is a new pair of shoes. To this day, at 70-something years old, he still walks the same corner, the same street corner in New York and takes care of that same neighborhood. And it makes you wonder, what makes a man do that? And we're worried about what we're going to buy over here and how we look to the people down the street that don't even like us. Trying to impress people that really don't even, we shouldn't be worried about impressing
I don't want breakthrough to be that kind of church. I truly believe that if we are a church that loves people, God, God will send people from the north, south, east, and west. I, I believe that what makes you get up and do things that don't make any sense and take the time out of your life is that you have such a love of God because of what he's done for you. What keeps you committed is you know that God loved you that much. Can we pray because I'm about to cry? Is that all right? Come on, church, just pray. Don't pray out loud if you don't mind. God, I love you so much. God, I know I'm not perfect. Lord, you have been so good to me. Despite my faults, my failures, my shortcomings, God, you have just blessed me when I didn't deserve it. God, I pray let Breakthrough become a church that loves people that don't even make any sense. Lord, give us a passion for souls. God, give us a passion for people. Lord, if nothing else, God, let the people understand the love of God. Let us build a foundation in this place that flows outside of the four walls of this church. Lord, let us expand our faith. Lord, I, I pray that somebody has heard this sermon today that despite of me, God, and despite my presentation, that they understood it. That it Lord, that it puts a fiery dart inside of their spirit and it puts fire down inside of their bones. That when they walk out of this door, they want to be a witness unto you. That when they walk out of this door, God, they can't help but go and try to change the environment. That they go and try to change their jobs. They try to change the community, the city. That we go and change the world, God. Let a love of God come out of this place for people that become so strong we don't even understand why we're doing and what we're doing forgive us God for thinking church is about a show and let us remember God church is about people Lord I don't know what they're going to do this morning God but I'll repent for not loving you more to not being a better witness Lord, I pray, let us be committed at Breakthrough. Not committed, God, just because of a name, but committed to what you've called us to do. Let us reach people like we've never reached people. That when they come in this building, God, that the devil himself knows the love that's in this place. That he's fearful to walk into a place that God's people are standing. Let us expand our faith as Peter told us. In Jesus' name, can the church say amen. God bless you. Have a good week.